Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Gerstenhaber. I'm a director of product at Datadog for container integrations and metrics. I'd like to thank Shuba earlier for highlighting AWS App Mesh and its capabilities. The implications uh, for, of this for observability is exciting, but before I dive in, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, Datadog for context. Datadog provides observability for every layer of your stack. We started our lives as a metrics product, which tell you what is happening, and then we added application performance monitoring to give you code level visibility. More recently, we added log aggregation to tell you what the applications are saying and can be sliced and diced by the same context, by the same tags as everything else, as well as synthetics to give you the out a view outside in, and now network performance monitoring, which I'm here to talk about in a moment, and dovetails nicely with the capabilities explored by AWS App Mesh. With this in mind, let's talk briefly about how we got here and why we're looking uh, to solutions like Service Mesh. This is what the world looked like when I started working. AWS EC2 started uh, in my senior year of college, and my first couple jobs were in rooms like this, where it was very cold and the fans were very loud. Uh, if we wanted to scale out, we would need to order new hardware, rack it, configure it, et cetera. Then everything moved to the cloud, and I think that's why a lot of us are here today. Everything is driven by code, and code is independent of hardware and provisioned with APIs, and we can auto-scale. Still, these patterns are continuing to change. This is what Datadog looked like when I joined about three years ago. Each of these hexagons represent individual VMs, and we provisioned those VMs to individual teams. So each team was single tenant on a VM. This gave us fault tolerance at the VM level layer, uh, but was inefficient. Uh, here you see metrics intake uses more of their resources, logs and compute uh, comparatively few. So over the last about year and a half, we have made a major move to containers and at the same time to Kubernetes. The direct implication of this is that our applications and your applications are now dynamically being scheduled depending on the availability and the user's desired state. We have shared infrastructure and fault isolation is not enforced at the VM level, but by namespace and C group, allowing us to move things around more quickly, spin up new containers, uh, et cetera. This is sort of what, look, uh, what data looks like today. Uh, here, I am aggregating containers by host and team to show you that we do share infrastructure. All of our teams share common fabric and are running their own deployments and services. This is actually taking from, taken from our staging environment. This represents less than 10% of production. So there are a lot of things. We see these patterns uh, increasing in, in scale. In our latest container study, which we, or rather orchestration study, which we uh, launched uh, this morning, we see that Fargate, uh, which is uh, serverless containers, is running in almost 20% of AWS container environments. It's been an enormous move to this technology since it was launched a couple years ago. And I'd like to thank uh, Nathan this morning for also speaking about EKS managed nodes, which we uh, support as well. So this pattern encourages smaller and smaller microservices, each with a more limited failure domain and are quicker to spin up and down. But this implies its own complexity. With increasingly small ephemeral and orchestrated workloads, the number of dependency in your systems is ballooning as well. Let's look at one Datadog trace. Here uh, we have a trace. This is from our uh, metric system, I think, uh, and uh, batch query, yep. And it takes about 50, uh, 65 milliseconds to complete the entire transaction. As we can see, there are multiple paths of dependent services. And whether or not one application actually calls another or they're called in series, the latency experienced by the user is the cumulative latency injected by every part. Each of these microservices are often built by different teams and you can't always instrument every application anyway. Either you don't manage that dev team somewhere else in your organization, or else you're using third-party tools. This trace was actually taken uh, before our Kubernetes migration. This is more like what that same service looks like today. 
As you can see, there are 233 spans over 15 services, and 16 hosts are other managed services. The complexity is really growing. And with this in mind, it becomes clear why we're so excited about AWS App Mesh and Envoy. AWS App Mesh provides the control plane for this routing at the application layer. I can change the request behavior between services after deploying the service using logical endpoints identified by services or versions, not IP address and port. In addition, in most scenarios, customers send us telemetry about their systems, either in code or through API endpoints, but those systems would otherwise be a black box without the customer sending us that data. Service Meshes flips this on its head. Each Envoy is a sidecar in every pod, and this provides a path through which all application communication flows. We have a central point of observability for all transactions. Uh, the communication here is the source of, tr a source of truth about the entire application uh, topology. Now this is layer seven routing and service discovery. I'm also here to announce Datadog network performance monitoring, which will be GA tomorrow morning. This is monitoring for the layer three and four, uh, uh, layers three and four of, of your network stack. It's very, very lightweight and also sees all transactions at the TCP UDP uh, level uh, between two endpoints. But these flows are resolved up to layer seven uh, constructs, pod name, service name, replica set as well, because again, source and destination IP port are not sufficient in an ephemeral environment. Remember, there are still computers in the cat cloud. I talked a lot about, uh, our, about increasing complexity, and each method call usually involves a transaction, not just to another service, but again, because each individual team is distributed across all of our hosts, very, very frequently between hosts as well. So there's a lot of uh, dependency on that cop copper or optic wire, even though you don't have access to it anymore. So errors can be in code and sh uh, shown by application performance monitoring, in physical resource capacity, maybe you need more VMs, or in communication, maybe there's a dependency that you didn't expect or you're seeing TCP retransmits or something else. So I'm gonna hop quickly into a demo. Perfect. So this is a little toy application. Uh, you can see that there is an ad server, uh, web store Mongo, email, API, uh, Python script, and there's dependencies everywhere. Now, I'm gonna use AW App Mesh to reroute things. Here, I'm in the Amazon console, and I can see that my, I've balanced my transactions between three versions of my API. Actually, I'm gonna use the email API route uh, for this. So here, I'm starting at 60% uh, version one and 40% version, uh, version two of the API. And let's say I wanna cut way over to version two because I'm happy with the performance, everything seems okay. Here I can edit this. Now, yeah, and move it to 4060, perfect. So what happens when I do this? A lot of my traffic is moving to a different set of pods, to a different set of services. Hopefully I was ready for that, uh, but in this demo I was not. And what we see is errors uh, to that service, to that endpoint. We don't really know why at this point we're getting those errors. All we know is that this is affecting the service for our customers, and that's really what we care about. We care about the work metrics, uh, errors, latency, that sort of thing. So I'm going to move it back. This is all accomplished in the console and is layer seven routing. After I do that, what we see is that these traces look healthy again. We can dive into an individual one. Again, this starts with the Envoy. It goes into uh, the, the ingress, and we can see it makes a call to email API Pi 2. So this is a central point of observability by looking at the Envoy itself 
and watching traces that flow through the, the mesh. But what happened? Here, let's dig down into the network. I'm looking at a service to service view, but if I look at the ad store, we can see these are actually uh, endpoints that are IP and port. They're just aggregated to something that's meaningful to me. These ports, IP and port numbers, are, are ephemeral, and they don't really matter in time. What matters in time is the service name. Here I can see between the ad server and the email API pie, there were an enormous number of retransmits, especially compared to what we see on my other pods, uh, on my other services. I'm gonna drill in and look at pod name to Kubernetes service, which should be nice and balanced. And here we see that the ad server uh, is, in fact, well balanced to, to the email API pie, but we see re, uh, high retransmits among all of them. These do drop at the end when I made my changes, uh, but what had happened here is that I hadn't scaled up my, uh, my, my service yet, uh, my deployment. So I cut over being happy with the behavior, but the scale wasn't there. There weren't enough pods. I could use the HPA or something, but we'll ignore that for a moment. Uh, and we couldn't serve every request, and so we got, re and this exhibited in retransmits. And then we're back to our network map, and we can see the entire communication with everything, uh, but specifically we saw those high retransmits uh, between these two services. So I'd like to thank you uh, for, for spending this time with me. I do want to uh, highlight two things real quick. We do, uh, do we act as the external, external metrics provider for the horizontal pod autoscaler, so monitoring isn't unidirectional. We can use the monitoring tools to inform what's happening in our production environments. Datadog certainly does this. We have, uh, I think, a 2,500 node cluster, uh, but anyway. So we, we depend heavily on Kubernetes and horizontal, horizontal pod autoscaling. Uh, we also found recently that there were limitations to this uh, for our purposes. So we open sourced uh, recently the Watermark pod autoscaler. This is something that you certainly don't have to be using Datadog to use. You can inform it through any external means, uh, but will scale your, uh, scale your uh, deployments based on a high watermark or a low watermark, rather than scaling every single time a threshold is crossed. We found that on our biggest clust uh, clusters, this was necessary uh, for, for our operations. We built it for ourselves, but we think everybody else would benefit from it, and we've open sourced it. So we, I do encourage you to check it out, uh, use it, and provide feedback for us. Uh, again, you don't have to be using Datadog as the external source, although you can be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have not personally implemented it, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. The documentation is all there, though, actually. I have, well, I'm not on the screen anymore, but it's in the GitHub. <laughs> cool. Is Ignacio still in the room? Oh, yeah? Uh, you can certainly send us data from anywhere, uh, but it is a fully managed service. Thanks. I'll be around at KubeCon all week also, uh, so find me wherever. Thanks.